as we're getting into the buildup of Ali versus Liston 2, the rematch, we're going to look at the history between these two guys. This is not actually part of the documentary. I'm just adding these videos to the collection so you can understand what the environment looked like at the time. Now, one of their first interactions came in November of 1963 when Ali showed up to Liston's house. It happened right before the signing of their February 1964 battle. I'm gonna hurt you till you fight me! What about that night, the middle of the night when you turned up uh, at Sonny Liston's own home? Oh yes, that was in uh, Denver, Colorado. We went to his house one night before the signing of the contract in Denver and I drove my bus in his front yard and told him that I uh, blew my air horn, woke him up and he came out in the middle of the night in his underclothes, his robe, and he had a big stick. And he said, you get out of my yard. And I said, you big ugly bear, you. I'm gonna see you tomorrow for the signing and I'm gonna knock you out in eight. Sonny Liston was not known to be the friendliest of heavyweight champions that the world had ever seen. Here we will look at Liston in an interview just to get an idea of what his personality was like. And you better believe he was on best behavior as Sonny usually really did not like talking to reporters. He was very short with them. And some said that he was even rude at times. But this here was actually a planned interview that they had with Sonny Liston. So let's take a look at Sonny Liston, get an idea of what his personality is like, and then we'll move on. Do you think in general boxers are improving too? Well, I would say slowly but surely. Mm -hmm. Are they receiving fine coaching? Uh, I know you are. Are others? Well, some fighters, you can tell them, but they won't listen. But I'm a good listener. I know it's for my own good. Sonny, I've worked with athletes for many, many years, and I can say with a high degree of accuracy that I have never really seen anyone train more diligently than you've been doing around here during the last few days. Well, in the morning, I get up at 5 o'clock, and I run about 5 miles. Eventually, I work up to 5. And after that, I come back and I go to bed. I sleep until about 10 o'clock. Then after that, I get up and eat breakfast, take a walk for about a mile and a half. Then I sit around for a few minutes, then I go back to bed. Then I get up and come over and have me a cup of tea. And I start training, skipping ropes, hitting the heavy bag, light bag, boxing, doing calisthenics. You believe that the man in the best condition certainly uh, has the greater chance to win, I'm sure. Yes, I do. Well, I admire you for paying this price, Sonny. You, you really train hard, and you, do you enjoy training hard? Yes, I do, when I know I got a fight, huh? <laughs> Sonny, how old were you when you had your first boxing match? Well, when I first started, I was uh, 13. I went to the gym and I got a selection, so I said, uh, <laughs> that's not for me. And so and then again, I waited until I got 18, and I was big, and I, had, I weighed 218. So I figured, I said, well, I'm a man, now I can take it on my own. Did you ever get a chance to fight the fellow who gave you the sh shellacking? No, I never did see him. As a matter of fact, I wasn't looking for him either. <laughs> well, that's certainly a case of good judgment. But when you were fighting as a pro, um, <clears throat> was there any particular fight when you first realized that you, 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 you came in, you're ready to go, you could beat anybody? Cleveland William. When I fought Cleveland William after I went to the dressing room, and all the newspaper writers came in, so we... Now that we believe you can take it after that fight, and... He must have been real tough. He was... He could punch real hard, and he was fast. And after that fight, I felt that I could beat anybody. He had bigger muscles than you? Yes, he did. He was, he was all muscle. He even had muscles in his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> How do they go? The bigger they are, the harder they are. There's the cut iron, too. <laughs> You have to chop that big tree a lot harder and a lot longer. That's right. What's wrong, uh, Sonny, with the kids in our country today? They don't seem to have much enthusiasm for exercise. Do you have any comments on that? Well, I think their parents buying them cars too quick. Yeah. It used to be that when they get 18, they want a bicycle. Now they get 18, they want a car. 
Sonny, uh, what advice would you give to a, a young lad who came to you and said, I want to become a boxer? What would you tell him as regards training and so forth? Well, they always told me anything you want to do. Do your best and be the best at it. And the training part, he has to pay a price, doesn't he? Yes, he do. That's a really train for anything you go out to, you have to train at it. You get out of it what you put into it, pretty much. Yes, you do. I would like to work with the uh, kids in the youth center and everything. Mm -hmm. They need help, don't they? Yes, they do. Sonny, tell me, what was the happiest moment of your entire career? The happiest moment? Mm -hmm. Well, when I married my wife, was the happiest moment of my career. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have any real sad moments? Well, when they turned me down for license in New York to fight for the championship, mm -hmm. something I have always wanted to do. It was kind of sad that they did it, but it... Chicago made me very proud of it. Before Sonny Liston had got involved in the sport of boxing, he had been arrested numerous times. He had a problem with law enforcement, and even after he turned pro, he continued to get arrested and get in trouble with law enforcement. He didn't have any difficulty or any problems putting his hands on law enforcement officers. He also had served time in prison. By 1965, the WBA were tired of Sonny Liston. They were also tired of Muhammad Ali because he was affiliated with what the media called the Black Muslims. And Cleveland Williams had recently got in trouble and was shot by a law enforcement officer. Cleveland Williams and Sonny Liston were buddies. What the WBA decided to do was remove Ali as their champion and take Cleveland Williams and Sonny Liston out of their ratings. Sonny Liston was always struggling to clean up his image. Joe Lewis was sent in to help him develop interaction skills when dealing with the media. He was getting ready to go into his second fight with Ali, as we all know. He lost his first fight with Ali, and Ali would take the belt from Sonny Liston and become the champion. So Sonny Liston was working his way back up that hill. Millions of words have been written about Liston's long reach and his devastating style. Welcome to our show on the spot, Sonny Liston. We appreciate you coming here for this interview. And as you know, this is the third time we have met before the television cameras. Right. There's once more than me and Patterson there. That's right. And I'm <laughs> glad I didn't meet you under the same circumstances. Sonny, before we actually start talking about Cassius Clay and other questions I have in mind, how about demonstrating before the television viewers uh, some of the physical prowess that you have? Uh, would you put your hand alongside of mine and let's see, boy, my, my hand there is lost. Oh. Tell me, when you, uh, when you turn your hand this way, what can you hold without any trouble? I can pick up a basketball. A whole basketball. So a football would be easy or anything along that size. Yeah. What about your reach? Could you demonstrate your reach for us? If you want to, you can stand up. I know you've got a seven foot Reach supposed to be the longest reach in the history of boxing. Yeah. <clears throat> well, that is long. I would think Cassius Clay's reach about the same. Has, has Cassius got a seven foot reach? Not my, mine might be a little longer than One that. more thing before we get in Cassius Clay. What about doing this? All the boys like to see you do that. That's all muscle, isn't it? Isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Is there any real hard feelings between you and Cassius Clay, personally? Well, it isn't any with me. I may, I know that uh, it would be just like a guy coming in to stick you up. There's no hard feeling between you, but you've got something he wants. <laughs> <laughs> you once said that Cassius Clay should be arrested for impersonating a fighter, which I know is just a wisecrack of yours. Uh, you still feel that way? Well, at the time, I couldn't say that because, it, you know, any time two heavyweights meet, anything could happen. Well, I think Terrell is about the third, I think. Who? Terrell. Terrell. I don't know where Matrim's standing now. Well, Matrim seems to be sliding down, doesn't he? He's sliding someplace. I don't know where he's down or up. <laughs> but uh, is the heavyweight division that devoid of good material where there's just you and Clay and and that's about well, it. Well, you mean to be saying Clay, you can just say it's me. Just you, that's it. <laughs> Leave Clay out. We can forget about everybody else. Huh? You mentioned uh, 
Joe Lewis. Uh, Mrs. Joe Lewis, uh, she's your attorney, is she not? Yes, she is. And uh, how long has she been your attorney? I said she's been my attorney about five months. Five. I know you received a beautiful gift from President Lyndon B. Johnson when he was vice president. Uh, what did he give you, Sonny? He gave me a watch and a pair of cufflinks. How long ago was this? About, about six months. Well, now he's the president of the United States. Do you hope to see him again soon? Well, I'm looking forward to it. What was your impression of the assassination of President John Kennedy? What did you think of that? Well, it hits you just like someone in your family has gotten it. It was really a tragedy. You couldn't believe it at first. Greatest tragedy this country's known. Yes, it is. Did you ever meet President Kennedy? No, I never did. And how tall are you? Six one and a half. What's your chest expansion? <laughs> I don't know. Last time it was 48. Could you uh, give us a little half a minute demonstration of inhaling and exhaling and show us your chest expansion? Just like you're going to take a deep breath. Right? Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, you have to know how to do that. A lot of, I don't know, I really haven't practiced on expanding my chest. It just comes natural. You don't specialize in that no. somatic purpose. Sonny, what's wrong with boxing today, in your opinion? Well, I think it's... Uh, Certain guys in it don't know anything about it. By guys, you mean fighters or managers? Managers. And you will lay all the ills of boxing on these managers that are not qualified or trained or That's right. not necessarily good managers? Well, in what respect uh, is that the foundation of what's wrong with it? Well, I would say a manager, as I tell uh, my manager and my trainer, I tell them when the bell rang, I said, y'all the best duckers in the world. Y'all can stand out there and, and be ducking for me and never get hit. But I'm the only one going to get hit in there. And the manager don't feel it. So if the promoter would give him $1,000, he would take a fight. And which the fighter shouldn't be fighting a fighter like that. Is there anything else wrong with boxing besides... Uh poor managers? Well, I don't think it is. I would say if besides poor management, everything is fine. Sonny, what can be done to cut down deaths in the ring? There was a wave of publicity in the press of this country over the last six or eight months in which uh, that was pointed up that it seemed that in recent years more fighters died in the ring than, than people expected. Well, I would say <coughs> Uh, different, like light heavyweights fighting heavyweights and uh, welterweights fighting middleweights. They're stepping out of their class because uh, each class gets more money than the lightweights and things like that. And they would do this to get more money. Sonny, we all know that the best fighter is a hungry fighter. Do you think that's one of the things wrong with boxing that... Uh the prosperity of this country has reduced the opportunity and the desire of many people are forcing to become fighters? Well, I couldn't say, I don't think to fight. Like, now, if you take my record, I was brought up the right way. When I fought Foley here, I was number two. And uh, he, was, he was number two. So they made me fight him, and then they put him in my spot. I would just say, for instance, if I lose to Cassius Clay, I should be number one, and then fight the number two guy. And then if he beat me, just going back down the steps. There's been a lot of mismatching, is what you're saying. Right. Sonny, how long ago was it when you first sensed that you would become the heavyweight champion of the world? In your own mind. Well, when I felt it, when I uh, fought Cleveland Williams in Miami. How long ago was that? About five years. Now, how did that fight end? Was it a knockout for you? Yes, it was. What round? Third round. Third round. Now, what made you think when you were through with that fight, 
five years ago that you were the next champion? Well, the way he could hit and he punched hard and after the, the fight, we went back in the dressing room and all the reporters came in and said, now we believe you can take it. it was, uh, well, did that surprise you? It must have. Did you then say to yourself, well, here I've met one of the heaviest fighters of my time and I've knocked him out and that give you the confidence to make you feel you would be the champion of the world? Is that what went through your mind? Yes, it did. And then I looked at his record and he had a string of knockouts. Before I fought him, I told him, and then I said to myself, I said, oh, these are nothing but setups. And after the first round, and I went back to my corner, and uh, I told my trainer, I said, they wasn't set up. So I said, he knocked these guys out. <laughs> so he said, you got to get in close on him. And I said, either that, we got to get out of here. <laughs> because this guy is really something. <laughs> so and I moved in close on him, and I won the fight in the third round with the knockout. A lot of people think they're all these, but they're not. They don't know what we have to go through to get in shape to win the fights in the first round. What are some of the things you have to go through? Well, you have to get up 5 o'clock in the morning, run about 5 or 6 miles, come back and go to bed, and, and get up there and go to the gym, do about 12 or 13 rounds of boxing and training, you know, hitting a heavy bag. A lot of preparation. What about a fellow who has in mind entering the ring as a profession, Sonny, what would you tell him? Well, I would say that he have to live by have to live by the rules and cooperate by them and come out on top. It's all in the knowing how to live. What's the most important thing a fighter should have to be a success? Should he have a fighting heart or a heavy punch? Of course, he needs them both. But if he had only one or the other, which does he need most? Well, it's, it's hard to say about the heart. You know, a lot of fighters got a lot of heart, and uh, I guess you have to have a little skill with it, too. Getting back to that comment you made about managers a few moments ago on this broadcast, in which you said uh, a good deal of the fault that lies with the boxing today are poor managers, uh, and you indicated some of the managers would just sell the fighter out for $1,000, I think you said, or whatever the amount is. Is that... Uh, more common today than it has been in the last 10 years prior to this? Well, excuse me, I couldn't say because uh, when I was in St. Louis, I had this manager, and uh, Johnny Summerlin, he was from Detroit, and we was driving up to Detroit to fight, so I didn't know who I was going to fight. And so we get almost there. I says, who's fighting the main event? And then he tells me, you are. It's the first you heard of it. Yeah. And then after we get up there and I beat him, he picks up the paper the next day. They want to know what Sumlin offer was I just that good. It was supposed to have been, a, I suppose it had been, a, I guess, a duck for him or something. So and they rematched us. And then I beat him easily the second time because I know what I had to go up against. And then I did the first time. And the fight that I lost, and the only fight that I ever lost was in Detroit. And I still had the same managers. They sent me up on the train and told me they was coming the next day on the plane. So when I get ready to go in the ring, I don't see nobody. I had to go down inside the ring and just get me somebody to go in the corner and take my mouthpiece out. See, and it was a manager that had his heart and a fighter would be better. Sonny, what do you attribute the tremendous force that you pack in your fists? Is it due to good conscientious training and the fact you were born with this power or have you developed that brutal strength right in your fists through some other way? Yeah, I guess a uh, few things I picked up from Joe Lewis. Uh, I remember reading a book about him. He says, uh, don't hit at your target. So I always try to hit through it. And when you do that, I develop a good left hand from that. Don't hit at your target, hit through it. Try to punch through it. Now, uh, 
what did you do to apply that? How did you adopt that outside of saying that to yourself? Well, I go out and I try to play through it. <laughs> Just as simple as that. Well, you're able to go right through them. In fact, uh, that seems to be the common practice right. with you now. Who are some of your idols in, in boxing? You certainly must have someone that you'd like to follow or someone that you've honored in your own mind as a great fighter? I would say Joe Lewis. Did you ever see Joe Lewis fight as a champion? Well, I see the uh, movies, not in real life. What's the first heavyweight bout you ever witnessed outside of your own? I don't think it was in the... You never uh, saw any? Uh, I never saw Braddock fight or Schmeling or... That's even before your time, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, you never saw anybody fight in the early 50s as a heavyweight champion? Well, uh, here's the Charles. Here's the Charles. And uh, what went through your mind the night you saw him? Did you picture yourself standing there holding the crown someday yourself? Well, no, I never gave the thought then. What about Jersey Joe Walcott? Did you ever see him fight? Not in real life. Uh, he was remarkable in one respect. It seems he never had a bruise or a scar or any mark of a fighter. Isn't that true? Yeah, well, I guess that's when he rode the back all the time.